guests who are joining us virtually from all over the world. Uh, a warm welcome to this session on supply chain management and its implication in the post-COVID era and how to teach and how to research. Uh, we have very uh, important distinguished guests with our speaker, uh, Professor Shams Raman, who will be talking about this very important topic, uh, technology and the changing landscape of supply chain management, what to teach and what to research. Now, we are organizing this jointly from uh, EMK Center and ULAB, uh, particularly in uh, Bangladesh Supply Chain Management Society, uh, particularly talk about uh, the whole supply chain issue that, that the world has faced due to pandemic and the whole issue of the fragmentation and how it kind of had an impact on Bangladesh as, as well as all over the world. Uh, for us from the EMK Center, uh, our main objective is to really look into small entrepreneurs and how this supply chain actually has created a problem for them and what is an impact and how can we recover from there. Uh, from ULAB, I think uh, Professor Imran Rahman will talk about our objective here, but uh, just to talk about a little bit about that. Uh, so we do have a lot of students who are actually uh, kind of now doing supply chain management measure uh, in MBA or in, in, in BBA. But uh, the core issue here is basically the way that supply chain has got fragmented due to this pandemic. And the issues that are, are placed, I, I read everywhere, uh, particularly in, in most of the international journals by saying that managing the supply chain uh, would be a key uh, kind of challenges for all the businesses across the world over the next uh, kind of decade. Now, as we teach, and, and, and when you teach to the students, we actually talk about the kind of the traditional supply chain management. But however, uh, this is what is kind of struck me, is basically we are not talking about the contemporary issues that are coming out. Uh, how do we fix this? What is the impact of it? Uh, what do we search about it for a particularly a country like Bangladesh? Uh, what has been the impact of a fragmented supply chain? And, and how things got delayed? Uh, I know the RMG suffered a lot. I know the food for leather, food for export industry suffered a lot because of delayed in uh, arrival of raw material as well as uh, kind of shipment. So with that, uh, we, we are organizing this. I hope uh, listening to this, particularly the faculties who have joined from all over the world, as well as our students, uh, you would kind of get a sense where we are going. And, and this is also a time for us to really look into how uh, we kind of bring in changes in how we teach on supply chain management and how do we do research. Thank you very much, a warm welcome. I would like to invite uh, Professor Imran Rahman, Vice Chancellor, University of Liberal Arts Bangladesh, to talk and briefly and welcome Professor Sams Rahman. Thank you, sir. Um, a very good evening. And thank you, um, Asifuddin Ahmed, for inviting me to this uh, exciting uh, seminar by my old friend from, and my colleague from my IBA days, uh, Dr. Shams Rahman. Um, as you can see on the screen, Shams is, uh, you know, is the professor of supply chain um, and logistics at RMIT University in Australia. And uh, I'd like to thank Shams for agreeing to come here. And I also take this opportunity of thanking, of thanking uh, the EMK Center for you know, working with ULAB to host this uh, seminar, which will be attended by um, uh, you know, various um, people from home and abroad, from academics to professionals all online. So ULAB has, in, in the last few years, um, started um, a kind of special subject area, a special specialization in supply chain and logistics. And um, it's an area that um, is very important. I think we saw particularly over the last two years of the pandemic of, you know, what are, what devastating and effects there can be around the world if supply chain uh, chains fail to meet the need of the hour. And I remember that there were, <coughs> such backlogs because suddenly a certain uh, you know goods and services were in demand during the pandemic which was not perhaps uh, forecasted before so it's an area that ulab wants to um, advance and we are very happy um, that uh, professor shams is with us and maybe you know he can guide us further uh, about how to make this uh, the curriculum 
and the pedagogy of this uh, uh, specialization uh, close to what you know the top universities of the world how they are teaching it um, we you know ULAB always wants to learn from the best and we want to make sure that our courses and the way we teach them are relevant and we don't uh, waste our students time and money in teaching them stuff that uh, they will never use um, and we would um, we would also like to say that uh, we're very happy that the Bangladesh Supply Chain Association, um, we are in talks with them and we're happy that uh, there's a prospect of ULAB working with uh, the association um, to first of all strengthen our curriculum and then to have resource sharing. They can bring in um, you know, qualified and experienced professionals who will be part of the uh, teaching and learning process. So this is something very exciting. I think business schools always needs to basically reach out to industry through the relevant industry and bring them into the teaching and learning space. So having said that, I'm, I think uh, let me once again give my warmest welcome to Dr. Shams Rahman. And uh, I hope you enjoy his, uh, his talk and take this opportunity to engage with him. Thank you very much. Before I start my very informal talk, I'll, I'll uh, okay, okay. Uh, 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 before I start my very informal talk on supply chain management, I'd like to uh, thank, uh, especially uh, the vice chancellor of uh, ULAB, a very old friend of mine, Professor Imran Rahman. Uh, every time I see him. Uh, he looks much younger, uh, but quite honestly. And uh, this is uh, something like a curious case of uh, Imran Rahman. So we must investigate further on, 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 on this, that what makes him uh, keep so young and, um, and uh, so that we can learn and we could keep ourselves energetic as well, young and energetic. And I would like to also thank uh, the president of uh, Supply Chain Management Society in Bangladesh. Uh, and uh, I understand that uh, uh, both ULAB, uh, EMK Center, and uh, the society uh, jointly uh, is hosting uh, this event. And uh, I'm so uh, delighted uh, to be with you all uh, with uh, my little talk here. As I said, this is going to be a very informal one. And I'd like to, however, I'd like to cover uh, uh, quite a lot uh, uh, over the next uh, 45 to 50 minutes uh, about a supply chain, about technology, and how technology is uh, shaping up uh, supply chain, and what to teach, and what to research. And um, in the end, of course, I would also touch up on a couple of issues with respect to Bangladesh economy and supply chain and technology, which way it is going right now and how supply chain can make a further impact. Uh, so that's, that's uh, essentially uh, is my uh, talk. Uh, so I'm going to touch on a little bit of industry for, which is uh, pretty uh, uh, familiar to you. And um, especially, I'll touch on a couple of disruptive technology, if you like. Uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, we'll look into supply chain in general, how it evolved over the years, and where we are right now, and uh, how the environment has changed over the years, and uh, what sort of skills and the competencies that we need. And of course, 
uh, that is that is a very important aspect. And in the end, of course, we can have uh, uh, we can think about what should we teach, and what should we research in this particular domain. And of course, there would be play, uh, ample time for asking questions. But once again, uh, thank you very much for coming for this little talk. Let's look at these uh, 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 work environments over the year that, were, uh, that you can see that uh, even before the first industrial revolution, it was basically hammer and sickle. And, uh, and uh, that's how uh, uh, that was so basic. And uh, during the first industrial revolution, as you could see over here, I'll, I'll touch on something that I, I, I picked up from economics as well, that how uh, the first industrial revolution and uh, Adam Smith's idea has shaped our supply chain. And uh, then, of course, we have seen the second and the third industrial revolution, and currently we are into the fourth industrial revolution. And as I mentioned, uh, that uh, I would be picking, I would pick up a couple of uh, disruptive technologies and see how uh, these uh, has shaped up. My talk is essentially on the basis of uh, a lit literature. Uh, as well as on the base based on our own research. Uh, so in combination of these two that we would be looking at. Uh, so you are familiar with that. Many of you have seen this uh, very diagram of first industrial revolution, uh, which is mechanization, steam power, and things like that. And uh, second is a mass production assembly line. Electricity became the power at that time. And the third one is an automation and the computer played a role, and which is still playing the role, of course, but we are into the fourth industrial revolution, which is cyber physical system, and uh, of course the internet of the thing and the network and so on and so forth, uh, which is still evolving at this stage. And um, of course, based on each time we look at industrial revolution, we see that there's a change in the work environment. There's a change in the, in the, uh, in the skills and the competencies that is required. And, um, and hence the training and, and uh, research. And uh, so uh, we can see that the supply chain structure uh, changes over time because of the technology and especially the disruptive technology and the skills changes. Uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, there was, an, there was a, a little seminar in Melbourne, uh, which was organized by our High Commission's office, Bangladesh High Commission's office. And they were, they were interested to uh, 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 hear a few a uh, uh, few presentation on his skill and competencies. And I actually did mention, I was one of the speakers, and I, was, I, I did mention that uh, when my father or father-in-law, uh, after their graduation, uh, they got a job. And uh, 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 my, both my father and father-in-law had only one job in their entire life. And uh, they enter into a, an organization, and they after 30 years, they retired from that organization. But I possibly have changed more than half a dozen of jobs. And I can see the next generation, uh, who could be in their early 30s, may have already changed uh, a, a, a dozens of jobs. What does that mean? It simply shows that uh, it's not necessarily that they're all the time uh, changing the do a job by themselves. They're sometimes forced to change, and sometimes they would be redundant, actually. And therefore, they would reskill themselves and then find another job. So job in the, at, in the, at the job position, you require to reskill and relearn the skills and the competency in order to optimize uh, whatever the value that you are uh, optimizing in a work environment. So that is a uh, very important aspect, that things are changing so rapidly, and therefore coping up with that is, is an important issue. And here is an Adam Smith, and many of you, especially the economists, definitely would know that. And uh, as you could see in his famous book, and which is on Wealth of Nation in short, 
and actually in the very beginning of this uh, thick book he start with this little quotation that one man draws out the wire another strains it and the third cards it a fourth paints it and so on and what does that mean that means he's saying that one person does not have to produce a pin we're talking about pin simple pin but we can divide the work into smaller segments and that way we would be able to optimize or maximize the productivity and that is the basics a basis of uh, 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 adam smith's uh, division of labor if you like and uh, therefore uh, it is it is it is how much um, I, I refer to these that how much we have learned from this basic idea which is more than 200 years old that we have taken that idea very idea and used it in assembly line uh, used it in automation and so on and so forth uh, but it is interesting that this is from where it comes although adam smith's book was uh, published almost 10 years later after the after the first industrial revolution but adam smith actually did not recognize that at that time unfortunately and therefore he was talking about not steam engine he was talking about steel uh, what you call a uh, just division of labor and the manual labor that he was talking about and therefore as you could see that uh, in, in, in he continues in there that uh, a factory employing 10 men who produce 48,000 pin per day if 10 workers did every step themselves they could produce 10 to 20 pins per day so the productivity is actually more than 50 times but if you are they make it automotive later on in in the third industrial revolution the same pin can be produced at a much higher rate and therefore the productivity has went up by 160 uh, 60 times that's what the technology that's how the technology plays a role here i just wanted to show that these disruptive technology or the innovative technologies are are uh, something uh, something <coughs> that uh, is changing uh, so fast that it 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 has what you call uh, uh, it changes the linkage with the market we are we are not talking about simply production but we are talking about the distribution as well and hence uh, 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 if you look at uh, the diagram on the left you would find that when we are talking about disruptive innovation or the disruptive technology then obviously uh, the production uh, system has changed on one hand on the other hand the market linkage changes as well and one of the brightest example that I could come up with is with the music industry and uh, as you could see that over here that the first gramophone many of you may not have seen the gramophone uh, but was was produced in 1877 and as you could see that over the years gramophone from manual it became electrical it became from a big machine became a smaller machine and I remember when I was doing my undergrad, I had a Sony Walkman and I could put it in my pocket and listen to the music. So it became a smaller one. And uh, now eventually it became turned into uh, from tape to CDs and from CDs uh, to different technologies altogether. And now what do you do? We don't carry music anymore. So if you think about those who have, have, have seen the gramophone uh, in, 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 in early 20th century, they would remember that uh, carrying uh, the gramophone set would require maybe uh, a small three-wheeler and maybe three people would be required to carry them from A to Z. And whereas now you don't need anything to carry because you do have your cell phone and you can simply download and listen to the music. So you can see that um, from a logistics and supply chain perspective that you don't have to carry anything now. 
it is digitized and therefore uh, that is how the supply chain of the music how you capture the music and then you distribute the music has changed so much over the years so that's basically what i wanted to show over here that if you have a disruptive technology which is in here and therefore you are the market create new linkage you do, you, you do not have any, any, any um, right now, the total market has changed the way that you interact um, with this technology. And uh, that's exactly what is happening. So since we are talking about, uh, uh, just I mentioned about production and distribution, let's look at from a historical perspective uh, uh, what happened with the production and, uh, and uh, distribution. And that's very much the supply chain. And as you could see, uh, this is what I picked up. And that was published in the magazine, which is called Distribution Age. And that was published in 1923. We, we, are not talk, we did not talk about supply chain in those days, of course. And as you could see, in 50 years, between 1870 and 1920, the cost of distribution of necessities and the luxuries had tripled. And while the production cost has gone down by one-fifth. So what we saved in the production is actually being spent in the distribution. And uh, that is the trade-off that we have between, between uh, production and the distribution. Just imagine that nothing much has changed after 100 years later that uh, CEO of Lin and Fung, uh, you, you're pretty much familiar with this organization, has said exactly the same thing. He said, you can try to squeeze the cost of production down by 10 or 20 cents per product, but today we have to be genius to do that because you have exhausted every avenues to minimize the production cost. So what we address now, we address in the distribution to minimize the cost, and that's where the money is. And that's why we are talking about more in, about the supply chain. So that's, that's really interesting that uh, the two quotations that I picked up uh, was, was published almost 100 years apart, but they are talking about almost the same thing uh, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, supply chain. And therefore, the production and the distribution is a major issue. This is a seminal work which was done by Professor J. Forrester back in 50s. And uh, those who are teaching, doing research in supply chain management, invariably would know about J. Forrester's this seminal work, which is production and distribution system, he called it. So in those days, we're not talking about supply chain. We did not call it supply chain management, but he also called it as a production and distribution. But I found that in a formal manner, perhaps this is the beginning of looking at the research of supply ch in supply chain management because he actually simulated that a supply chain Although he talks about production and distribution system, but this is essentially a, a uh, supply chain. I literally cut and paste here that was published in Harvard Business Review back in 1958. Uh, and as you could see, here's a factory, here's a factory warehouse, is a distribution center, there's a retailer, and there's a customer. That's entirely a supply chain management. And he actually showed us from there that what happens if uh, there is an issue uh, with, uh, with, within the supply chain system, then uh, what may happen? And this diagram has clearly shown that on one hand, uh, that uh, uh, lack of collaboration, lack of transparency, uh, lack of understanding between the partners in the supply chain uh, would create adverse impact. And therefore, we see on one hand, when the inventories are necessary, we don't have inventory, we have a stock out 
situation. But when we need, when we don't need the inventory, then we build up the inventory. This is a typical supply chain problem that we encounter every day. If you go and ask any retail store, you will find that at least from between 7 to 10 percent of the sales price uh, would be would be over stock if not more and uh, similarly around the same uh, percentage would be under stock what does that mean it simply means that uh, if our profit margin uh, could be maybe between two to four percent only whereas where expenses or over stock and under stock could go up to uh, 10 to 15 percent and therefore, just minimizing a little bit over there would make, would go straight into our bottom line. Without going further into this, because this is such an interesting work uh, done by Jay Forrester that ultimately uh, uh, it is Procter & Gamble, as you know, that picked up that one in, in back in early 90s, that when uh, with a very simple product, which you call a disposable nappy for the kids, for the child, babies, uh, that they had a serious issue with that particular product. And they uh, identified that this is a miscommunication, this is a misunderstanding, this is a uh, 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 misalignment of the business, and that the Therefore, that's the reason why we are having this problem. So it is not Jay Forrester uh, who uh, made uh, this phenomenon popular, but it is Procter & Gamble made it popular in, 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 in not only in business, but also in the academia. And since then, we call it bullweave effect. And many of you would definitely would know about it. Is the pull effect still happening? Although we do have very super computer now, we still see that it is happening. And it is happening not simply in April industry or any particular electronic industry, but it's happening in many different industries. And uh, it is happening also, just I picked up from a Wall Street Journal, uh, some odd 11 years ago, if you like, and uh, that when there was an, that was an, uh, what do you call, uh, 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 the recession, uh, global recession back in 2007, 2008, during that time, we have seen that uh, from the computer chip, the supply of computer chip from Taiwan to the United States have slowed down. And that also had an impact of, uh, of what you call bullish effect, but in a negative way in a negative way, and that's why we see that the term, so the supply chain uh, was not filled with the supplies, but it dried out, it dried out the supplies. So that's sort of a phenomenon that we still would see, we are seeing, although we are still using supercomputer, we are still talking about collaboration, we are still talking about understanding each other, we are talking about transparency and everything, still we are having these problems. Let me just, since we have a problem here, but obviously the managers and uh, of course the academics are uh, very innovative and as well as intelligent people and they know that how to how to tackle this from a different uh, strategic perspective and therefore no matter what the problem uh, problem is they try to solve it as much as possible and therefore some of the seminal work which was given by uh, Hazen will write back in late 80s if you see and uh, that is interesting that you are you are dividing and trying to conquer because you have a problem you have a problem and how do you divide that divide separation in space and that is what as you could see on the x axis you have a job flow uh, a flow shop line flow and the continuous flow on on the on on the, at the top which is a uh, product structure, there's a different kinds of products that we see. So what we are talking about here, that the choice of the product would affect the choice of the process that is involved. Because we are trying to optimize, we are trying to uh, 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 increase the uh, pr productivity and hence we got to make sure that we have the right product at the, for the uh, right process for the right product. And that's why it is a, a product and process matrix 
Netflix, which is on the right hand side. And therefore, simple example, we, pr we, we produce cell phone or a computer, which is which has continuous flow, and that therefore, which is a standardized high volume product. On the other hand, if we want to buy an um, uh, 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 Boeing 747, for example, that's come to my mind at the moment. And uh, then you have to, you have to plan a, a long ahead. And therefore, that is a, a one of a kind and a low volume. And that that's a preferred uh, a process would be a job shop process. So that is from a production perspective, because we are still talking about production, really. And therefore, from there, we see that we moved into supply chain. And they, again, it is a divide and conquer, as you could see. Therefore, we get a mat matrix here, which the Fisher has uh, provided us, uh, this uh, seminal work in back in late 90s as well. Again, we see that the product determines what sort of a process, and this process is a supply chain process. So we move from an organization perspective to a supply chain perspective by looking into that. And if we move into the next, the same thing, but we are talking about dividing what? It is separation within a whole. So before you have seen that one again similarly, but we can divide that again into different segments and try to optimize uh, the process and try to deliver the right product to the right uh, 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 buyer or the customers. And similarly, we can divide our supply chain into two different uh, uh, segments uh, where uh, for some we need to forecast and for the second half of our supply chain we need we can we can get the rich information market information in order to produce and deliver it quickly and of course for this uh, especially for dividing these supply chain we owe to uh, Hewlett Packard HP is the one who introduced this, and we owe them quite a lot. So we do learn from academic like Jay Forrester. We also learn from Procter & Gamble, and we also learn from HP. And uh, therefore, that's how we try to uh, make things uh, much more uh, uh, you know, uh, productive and optimal, if you like. So similarly, there are a few examples here, as you could see. Uh, 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 the food supply chain, it is a form of logistics, is a warehousing. Warehousing especially, uh, uh, I would like to mention here that is a cross-docking and a classical warehousing system. So there are two different ways uh, that we can process the product and uh, much more faster and a classical warehousing, which is to hold the product for a much more longer time. And uh, that's how we can see that one. Uh, uh, in terms of the port, it could be a port activities that we Chittagong, but we can also have a dry port. If the port can't accommodate, then we can bring it to the land, and then we can have a dry port. But in that case, of course, we've got to have an uh, extremely capable uh, link between uh, the, the warehousing system and the holding place of the dry port and the seaport uh, together. And uh, I would like to highlight here uh, the formal logistics as well, which is a cold chain vaccine. Uh, if, we, if we think about uh, three, four, five different types of uh, vaccines that we have against uh, COVID-19, then we would see that some of them would require a temperature of between 2 to 8 degrees Celsius, whereas Pfizer possibly needs a temperature that needs to be kept under possibly 50, 60, or 70 degrees Celsius. So that's where the cold chain plays an important role as well. So how do you divide them? How do you divide and uh, then manage them? So we can ma perishable food, non-perishable food. As you know that, especially in Bangladesh, that uh, uh, those are the, uh, the food products which are perishable. And uh, uh, with, an, with a rough estimate that we can, we can see that during the season, almost 30 to 40 percent of the perishable product would be spoiled because of the facilities that, uh, uh, lack of facilities that we require and therefore we can also classify them in a different way. That's just some of the examples that I wanted to show. Uh, obviously, uh, we cannot escape COVID. Uh, this is the third year and uh, we still uh, we, we know the impact of COVID. 
and uh, yes, uh, I'm pretty sure there would have been at least 30, 40 people here, but we are only having five people here and uh, or 10 people here. And uh, that is because of the COVID and uh, therefore, but it, 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 it still doesn't mean that um, uh, people are not listening to me. I'm pretty sure people are listening, sitting at their home and listening to me. And that is by the use of what? Technology technology and that therefore uh, e-commerce has become much more important and flourished and as you could see that um, how how it has grown but during the COVID time starting from 19 and it picked in 2020 so it simply shows that e-commerce is would be driving uh, these uh, uh, supply chain into the future and um, as well as this slide shows as well some of the statistics that's what's going to happen this year and um, and the following year so it is actually not simply a growth but this is an exponential growth of the e-commerce uh, people don't go out I was on the other day I said well uh, to my uh, to my knees actually I said I need to buy uh, you know what do you call uh, uh, Jamdani Sari and um, uh, she says mama we don't we don't buy it from shop anymore I, I buy online and I said wow uh, how do you choose? She says that, well, it is all there. You can choose the color, you can choose the design, you can choose and you can pay and that's it. So we are gradually moving to that really. But yes, the younger uh, generation are picking up much more faster than generation of my generation. Uh, but this will continue uh, into the future. So that's, that's what we see that as part of what? This is part of the distribution. Previously, we looked at from part of the production. Now we are looking at from the distribution. So distribution and therefore e-commerce, it's not simply one channel, but it's not simply uh, more than one channel, but we are having an omni-channel. And uh, therefore, uh, the, the structure of the omni-channel or the structure of the supply chain obviously would be different. Would be different. Uh, last time I was here in in Dhaka or, uh, in in January uh, January 2020 actually, and I went to visit uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, footwear uh, 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 production facility, uh, which is uh, near just beyond Tongi, and they do have a, a big. Uh, uh, big uh, distribution center uh, uh, just before going to Tongi. It's a huge one. And I was, I was uh, interested to learn that how they distribute the shoes uh, around uh, 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 the country. Uh, and uh, at that time, of course, uh, there was no COVID yet. Uh, so it was all um, uh, virtually uh, distributing through transportation system. Two years later, now I can see that they do, their products are visible online as well. And I'm talking about, uh, if I may name as well, it is one of the brand, Italian brand that, that they have, they have acquired here, which is called Lotto. So they are producing Lotto uh, here. So, uh, and uh, I, was, I was talking about and, and, and that um, I, I had the opportunity of talking to their uh, mid-managers and the senior managers and the production uh, managers and was talking about uh, the production system and the distribution system and the network as well that how they can optimize these things so this is an interesting phenomenon that we see from a distribution perspective and one thing that i would like to emphasize here that it's not simply uh, how do you channel it but it is what is important is the last mile last mile has become a, a, must more, a much more important than anything else. The last mile is the last leg of the supply chain. So I want to buy something from Coles or the Woolworth in Australia, for example, or a supermarket here from Shopna. And I'm saying, Shopna, well, yes, I'm placing an order online. I don't want to go to your premise, but can you deliver that to my place? And that from Shopna to my resident in Bonani is actually the last leg and uh, that is becoming much more important and uh, as you could see some of the statistics which is a horrible statistics that 13 
to 75% of the total logistics cost are actually uh, uh, is for the last mile delivery. And also they pollute a lot, 16 to 50% of the all pollution by the generated by transport is, uh, is at that last mile delivery. So that is something interesting and that is something that we, we must concentrate on and that is where um, uh, we, would be, uh, we, would be, we would be thinking about that how do we optimize our business by addressing our last mile delivery. If we, are, if we are placing an order, you all understand as a, as a customer sitting on the other side of the table, we would say that, well, why don't you deliver now? You know? So quick response makes a lot of sense is the last mile. And that's precisely uh, from a global study that we see that if you are, it is, it is addressing very quickly on, on the basis of the demand, then you would see that your, you would improve your sell by 1% to 4%. This is huge, actually. It's a huge, actually, improvement. And you would be able to reduce your operating cost by 5 to 10% which again contributes directly to the bottom line of an organization. And you would be able to reduce your inventory by 20 to 30%. And you, we all understand that how reduction of inventory, uh, how significant for managing an organization or a supply chain. With all these problems that we have uh, with managing everything, uh, uh, we still try to make our product global. And here is the brightest example. There's a tennis ball, which, is being, which used to be produced in about 300 kilometers north of London. And uh, it used to be used at the Wimbledon. And uh, uh, it's been now uh, a few years that it's, it, it's not being produced in that premises, in that production facility in the UK. It's being produced in the Philippines. And now imagine when I, uh, when I say that it's being produced in Philippines, is it really produced in Philippines? It's not. It's been produced by 14 different nations, whereas it used to be produced by the UK only and being consumed in the UK market, which is Wimbledon. But now it is being produced by 14 different countries. In other words, all these raw materials and everything being sourced from different countries and it is being put together in Philippines, packaging and done in somewhere else and, and then ultimately it's being distributed where? To the UK again. And the tennis ball actually literally travels more than 50,000 miles, which is actually about 80,000 kilometers globally. Think about it. But it still makes economic sense. It still makes economic sense. So supply chain has gone to that far. So therefore, it is so important that we, we look at the collaboration, coordination, transparency. These sounds very simple, but these are hard to manage. Uh, just to share with you that uh, uh, since I arrived uh, this time to Dhaka, I was visiting my mother, and uh, uh, on the th very third day, she fallen sick. And uh, I, we had to take her to one of the hospitals here. Uh, it is one of, the, one of the best hospitals in town, I can tell you that. And uh, believe me, over the last three and a half days, I was shuttling back and forth in the morning to the hospital and in the evening hospital. But I'm staying there. I was staying there uh, maybe each time I'm there, maybe three hours. But would you believe it, three, time, uh, three hours each in the morning and the evening, but my productive time was no more than 15 minutes. No more than 15 minutes, I can assure you this much. So this is one of the most reputed service center, which is a health service center, where there's so much of inefficiencies uh, through lack of alignment, 
coordination nobody knows and this afternoon uh, my mother was released and I was told last night that she would be released tomorrow in the morning I said what time they says well any time between 10 and 11 I said what time do you want me to come here says come at 10 o'clock so I was there at 10 o'clock 15 minutes past 10 and I came out of the hospital at 3 30 The problem that I uh, uh, encounter there, everybody wants to provide the service, no problem with them. They are very genuinely good people, they are honest people. But patient was ready, putting her own clothes, but the billing system and the finance accounting system is not, haven't done the work as yet. So I ask the management that what, the, what, the, what, what do you mean by releasing a patient? Can you explain that to me, please? I understood that releasing a patient means everything would be sorted out and we'll be taking at the same time the patient. Patient is already there, my prescriptions are there, but the billing system hasn't done the work and I'm waiting here for hour and a half to sort out the bill, which I could do that in five minutes. And therefore, the synchronization in the supply chain, this is what, this is within an organization that supply chain are having problems. So this is, this is uh, it is important that visibility uh, 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 coordination, uh, uh, cooperation, understanding, transparency are so important. And uh, with that, I would like to share with you, uh, 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 one of our academics uh, shared with me about uh, uh, um, uh, Rana Plaza. And uh, since we did some re research with uh, uh, RMG sector in Bangladesh uh, for a uh, for, uh, PhD student, and I had three PhD students who source data from Bangladesh, from RMG. And uh, that's how uh, we came to know quite a lot about Rana Plaza, what happened there. And recently, we also wrote a, a paper of 800 uh, words on Rana Plaza uh, in April this year for a very prestigious journal or magazine in Australia, which is called The Conversation. Uh, you may have heard about that. Um, and uh, Rana Plaza, uh, when it collapsed, uh, all the big brands were saying that they, their brand is not being produced there. In none of these uh, factories that were housed in that building, seven-storied or six-storied building. Later on, uh, the journalists from Australia, uh, they came down and they made a program. And we found that there are as many as five big April companies from Australia were sourcing product from those factories were there. Uh, so uh, there could be two things. One is that they genuinely they did not know. And because maybe the supplier or were outsourcing from other suppliers, and that, that lack of that space of a supply chain was not visible to the buyers. And maybe that's the reason they say that, well, no, we don't produce from, in that, from, from the factories which is located in that building. Or they were just trying to manage the damage. There could be either of these. So having had the transparency is so important, really. Coming to the industry four now, uh, because we did talk about industry three to some extent, and uh, now that's synonymous of that really industry four is basically we're talking about the technologies. And uh, therefore, in supply chain four is uses of those technologies. And that would make supply chain four, nothing else really. So therefore, by Looking at this diagram here, industry for technologies, and that they are, as you could see, um, uh, front end technologies and the back end uh, technologies, or the base technologies. Base technologies are internet of the thing, the cloud, big data, and analytics. Those are the base technologies. Whereas in the supply chain, we are talking about smart, war, uh, smart manufacturing, and 3D printing could be smart manufacturing. 
manufacturing uh, 3d printing many of you um, could be familiar with that or uh, blockchain could be uh, uh, one front end technologies which is a smart use for smart distribution if you like so smart product we produce through smart technologies and that we create a smart work environment and we have a smart supply chain from source to the market so that's where we see so this is something that i picked up from from uh, one of these uh, <coughs> survey work and they found that uh, uh, of all these industry four based technologies 3d printing is stands three in terms of the frequency of the studies if you like on that basis that i picked up one of these is a 3d printing and i would like to share with you some of these uh 3D, 3D printing uh, as in, in terms of our own research. 3D has got a tremendous opportunity uh, of 3D printing. It can produce my ear, it can produce a kidney, it can produce a gun, it can produce uh, the handle of the, of the cooking pan as well. It can produce anything that you want to produce. And that therefore, it, 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 it possibly, obviously, uh, we are not, the societies and the countries are not yet ready to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, address uh, the regulatory issues with respect to 3D printing. If somebody downloads how to produce a gun, and then they can sit down in their own home, and they can produce a gun. And they can say that, well, yes. Uh, this is we can use it and uh, and 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 therefore what should be the legislation what should be the regulation and uh, this is something in Australia that uh, the place where I'm from and uh, TGA this uh, 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 is a regulatory body which sits in the can in Canberra is still struggling uh, to handle uh, these manufacturing process but it's moving very fast it is still quite expensive but it is coming down the prices of 3d printing is coming down um, gradually and quite drastically and uh, this is going to transform our supply chain drastically drastically and from our own research that we have seen some of the benefits as you could see on the left hand side uh, that of 3d printing 3d printing of course you would know that it is it produces product just like our sanitary products if you like uh, so you, you, we put it in the oven sanitary products it's come uh, come come out as a whole rather than we screw them and build a product like this one but it comes out as a whole. So layer by layer, the material pour in and then takes the shape uh, of, of this microphone possibly. So there won't be any screws uh, to tighten up uh, every, every different parts, but it would be one piece and therefore it can be used. So therefore, as you could see from a supply chain perspective, that we see the benefits, so the flexibility and the simplicity in manufacturing. So you'd have lots of flexibility, and that is, the, that is the most important aspect. Many of you or all of you would be aware that having in the production system and the distribution system, creating that flexibility is an important issue. Mass customization benefit is an important uh, aspect. These days, we cannot mass customize because it becomes very expensive we can of course uh, but it becomes very expensive but 3d printing would be able to do that minimize the lead time the quick response closer to the customer why closer to the customer is something like that something that i i, I share with my with my with my uh, with my uh, students sometime uh, as a kind of a story that I'm an upstairs sitting in my study all of a sudden my uh, my wife from the kitchen shouts that uh, shout at me and says that well Shams the frying pan the handle of the frying pan is broken can you can you repair it quickly please so I use my 3d printing produce the handle and uh, bring it back to the kitchen and she continues cooking so this is possible this is possible and this is going to happen soon. So it is going to transform our supply chain totally in a different way. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, now the global supply chain may shrink uh, quite a lot. 
in other words, that we may not be uh, doing the outsourcing or buying most of the thing as we buy from China these days, and therefore we may produce ourselves in, 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 in our own premises, in our own location, in our own country. But however, we've got to make sure that uh, uh, we, we, we do have what you call uh, 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 what is the impact of this? But I'll, 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 I'll not talk about that, but we can talk about this in the context of RMG sector in Bangladesh and 3D printing. And this is how it's going to change. It is now, as you could see, that the traditional supply chain on my left hand side and the forward supply chain and the reverse supply chain together, it is still possibly like that. But when you see a supply chain for use of the technology, therefore it is much more in a network system that we would see. And that's exactly how the Amazon.com works these days. This is the brightest, one of the brightest example that how Amazon has become so successful in terms of this. But there are lots of challenges with respect to use of the um, uh, 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 3D printing. And uh, the quality is a challenge. Having the right skill and the design is a challenge. Uh, and the regulatory issue, as I have mentioned, is a challenge. The cost of raw material is a challenge. And uh, those are the challenges that we see. Uh, but I'm trying to move a little bit faster now. And uh, therefore, putting all those challenges on one hand and the effort on the other hand, and we could, we could then see that what are the big rocks that which would which are which are the critical uh, challenges and the level of effort required are much more higher and that is the printer cost the quality of, of the product because the quality is still a little bit rough and uh, uh, rugged and uh, and and that's why it is it is it needs to be uh, from a technology perspective it needs to be uh, 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 done much better the skill is an issue the cost of the raw material right now is an issue organization readiness and the regulatory issues are the major issues as well to overcome <coughs> blockchain uh, many of you are familiar with this uh, technology as well um, which can be used uh, to to store the information which has got the enormous capacity of storing information without being distorted by anybody else in the supply chain and therefore we can take it forward and uh, and uh, make the uh, uh, supply chain much more transparent this is also based on our work um, in indian context um, we look at many many firms in the indian context and we found out uh, that uh, uh, that the technological expertise is an important issue and at the same time the top management support triability is an important issue the complexity is an important issue but again we did the same sort of analysis that yes we do have the challenge and if we have the if we consider effort record as you could see that over here it is the compatibility is an important issue which is 6.3 that from our own uh, uh, scaling uh, as you could could see that finan financial resources is an issue. Uh, the top management support, of course, is an issue. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, putting together both challenges and the effort, we can, we can uh, definitely uh, find out that what needs to be executed now, where the actions could be delayed, and what should we implement immediately. Those are the managerial actions that we could consider from this perspective. After talking about the technology and the supply chain, uh, let's look at very quickly about the uh, management issues, the talent issues, which is skill and the competencies. Uh, <coughs> This is um, uh, from our own research in Australia and Indonesia and China. Uh, the Chinese study was a very, very large study and try to find out what sort of a skills that is required in supply chain uh, uh, industry in three different countries. As you could see, and we classed, uh, class, classify them into softer skill and the harder skill, and we picked up top 10 skills here out of 52 different skills that we put together. And as you could see that uh, most of these countries more or less 
are, are the skills that is required are really very basic skills that we are talking about which are related to the management skills which is which is communication team teamwork and the collaboration leader leadership customer focus those are the skills that is necessary of course we need we need to manage the quality we need to manage the reliability we need to do the data analysis and we need to have this uh, uh, what do you call analytical capability as well but as you could see very promptly came out the softer skills softer skills but of course these are the current skills that we are talking about in the current working environment and then we looked at whether they have got the sufficient competencies uh, to address those skills or not, or there's a gap between their own expertise and uh, that is required to perform at a higher level or not. As you could see, there is a, there is a huge gap and therefore training and uh, the reskilling is so important for them in, in, in both countries as you could see in, in China as well in the similar manner and uh, the customer service as you could see is an important aspect here. Now if that's the case then we are already lacking any skill in, in, in the domain of industry three and we definitely uh, when it comes to industry four, we would have much more or a bigger challenge. And uh, these are some statistics here, which tells us that uh, how big the challenge could be. That uh, if it is, it is as much as 30% of the hours work globally could be automated by 2030. And definitely there's a huge implication of that on skilling. As many as 40% of the job around the world would disappear in the next 15 years, as I was saying earlier. So if those things happen, up to 375 million workers globally, which is 14% of the global workforce, may need to transit to a new occupation category by 2030. So these are some of the, some of those, uh, what do you call, uh, scary statistics. Uh, and that is under industry four, and we must prepare that. And what would happen in the, in the context of Bangladesh, for example, with, with remittance, which is the largest foreign exchange earner remittance. Think about uh, one crore people are working around the world, are sending money to this country. 80% of them are in the Middle Eastern countries. And, uh, and, uh, and they are the ones who are bringing money, most of the money here. If the technology changes and the work environment changes rapidly over there, they would lose their job. The only, way, only one option for them would open to them is to come back home and they would remain unemployed. And that's why the skilling with the latest technology is so important for our nation. Three of my currently two actually a PhD student who comes from the Middle East. One is doing on digitization of the warehousing and distribution system in Saudi Arabia. And the other one is uh, doing in, in, in Abu Dhabi working on the health system using blockchain. Think about the situation. If you are, if you are a technician who is working, ba Bangladeshi technician working in a health system, uh, they, if they do not know how to operate a blockchain, for example, if that becomes an issue, then they are invariably going to lose the job. So that is an important issue with, with the pharmaceutical as well. And uh, as you could see that, uh, those are the skills that I mentioned before the current. And these are the skills that is the top, uh, uh, top skills that would be required in the future under supply chain four. It is what critical thinking is an important issue. It's not simply go and do this, but one has to think critically and perform the task. Must be creative, and that is important. 
emotional intelligence and it is judgment and decision making not necessarily all the time it is the data yes data is going to play much bigger role into the future but it is also the judgment which is be, would become much more important service orientation negotiation cognition flexibility these are the important aspect which we may not be covering in those areas of our of, of our skills right now and therefore this is important that we concentrate on this having said this just very quickly i'm coming to the last couple of slides possibly right now that uh, these days every time you open a newspaper you see covid and there's a word supply chain and therefore uh, you cannot escape from COVID. And if you go into, into a classroom, um, uh, half the textbook is irrelevant now. Uh, and therefore, you need to really think about what we teach. And, and, and therefore, I'm just, I'll, I'll just pick up uh, one, of the, um, uh, one of the issues that um, we do see a lot of uncertainties around uh, the two giant economies, uh, economies, which is US and China. And Brexit was an important issue until very recently. Uh, now, it's still an issue. So, but COVID or the pandemic uh, uh, has taken over. So, therefore, it is important that we think about this. So, from 5% of GDP in mid-20th century, that was, goes across the world. Now, we do have 50%. So therefore, it is a huge amount of product and services which are being done cross-boundary, national boundary. And therefore, we see that much longer, much bigger our supply chain. But it is coming what? This uh, world has hit the pause button at, at a least on globalization. This is an important aspect. So our students... Our, our executives must be aware of this. So this is something that we must bring to the classroom, which, is, which is, has to be a new, which is not really uh, that, uh, that in, in normal uh, the books that we would, would see there. Uh, <clears throat> Yes, we talk about lean, efficient supply chain, uh, agile supply chain, and all that. But we also have to think that how do we, uh, how do we make it uh, 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 much more uh, resilient. It is not simply being productive, being efficient, being agile, but it is resilient that is more important. And COVID-19 has given us that opportunity of thinking of about that. And therefore, we have moved from, from, if you think about the history of the last 70 years after the Second World War, you would find that we used to have just in case in 50s, 60s, 70s, just in case anything happens. So you store the material. And we moved on to 70s, 80s, 90s, until recently, just in time. But we gradually may move partly. I'm not saying that uh, we can avoid just in time, but partly moving into just in case as well. Uh, if, you rem uh, if I give you an example, we, are, we, are, uh, we were doing some research with Australian uh, 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 defense recently is a funded uh, uh, project and uh, and uh, there are two pr two simultaneously two supply chain that we are looking at uh, one is the infrastructure from the cyber security perspective the other one is uh, looking at the petroleum although Australia produces gas and oil but it doesn't hold it in Australia, it's being refined somewhere else, and it comes back to Australia again. And Australia used to keep uh, uh, the, the, the stock of oil for three weeks. Now they're thinking for the national security perspective whether that needs to be extended. That needs to be maybe 20 weeks that they are thinking about now. So that is an interesting aspect that how gradually moving from just in time to just in case as well. This is just an example. The other example that one of my, a couple of my junior colleagues and myself are working, which is on reshoring. 
uh, uh, the production of the manufacturing and that's also an important aspect really and how do you do that reassuring in a sense that yes some of these the critical uh, uh, the time critical pharmaceutical drugs time critical pharmaceutical drugs uh, that needs to be produced in Australia Australia is an island as you all know and therefore it takes the lead time is much more longer and that needs to be looked at from that perspective and uh, there are a few other areas that it's not uh, simply uh, the trade-off using mathematical model and minimizing the cost and optimizing the service, but we've got to think about sustainability and the resilience as well as I mentioned before the word resilient. Uh, COVID has also showed us that uh, uh, the, the public sector is a very important sector because the vaccine and the vaccination are being uh, 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 the vaccine is being produced and distributed by the public sector and not by private sector and therefore the private uh, in in terms of decision making the public sector is playing a very important role so that's something that we can bring uh, over here as well a scope for horizontal cooperation it's not simply vertical collaboration and cooperation but horizontal with our competitors that is going to be an important aspect from a teaching and research perspective supply chain finance is an important aspect and rmg sector in Bangladesh uh, precisely had a had a had a problem with the finance they have they have order was uh, uh, placed product were produced but product was sitting here and uh, the, the buyers are not taking it and they were not giving us the, them the money and therefore the finance became a major issue and uh, that is something that needs to be looked at cyber security is another issue from a teaching perspective from a research perspective, uh, as you all know that sustainability plays a very important role and therefore the disruptive technology and supply chain sustainability is an important issue. And uh, from a sustainability uh, perspective, we can see that it is also a reporting system. It is an uh, SDGs, uh, as you know, that is becoming globally very important. Um, a sustainable development goal, there are 17 goals, and uh, supply chain plays a very important role with some of those SDGs and GRI is also there and uh, this is something that uh, some of the works that we did in that space as well uh, if we look at this one uh, is an work on with with respect to global logistics firms that we have worked along with one of my younger academic uh, and uh, and uh, investigating uh, those uh, uh, sustainability uh, from the social uh, 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 capital theory perspective and a network analysis that how one firm can learn from another uh, 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 by, by looking at their disclosure disclosure in other words the reporting system that they have which could be in in terms of social disclosure or environmental disclosure if you like and this one that we did work uh, with OECD countries, uh, manufacturing farm, there are 200 manufacturing farms. With, there would be 200 red dots in that graph. And uh, as you could see that Hugo Boss is one and, uh, and uh, Impasse is one, Heineken is another one, and uh, over there Nippon is another one, is uh, Ecolab is over there, uh, Blackberry is over there. And uh, as you could see the return on asset Said. and on the other hand the social disclosure social practice and as you could see that some are much more clever but out of these we can find who are the leaders in the market out of these 200 uh, uh, firms uh, uh, I could I could keep on talking on this but uh, 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 because of the time and uh, this return on asset is actual value it's not if uh, uh, perception this these values has been taken from the organizations and uh, these uh, social practice of course this is based on uh, the data crunching from their annual report so uh, if we may uh, look at these now uh, 3d printing and 3e 3e is is uh, essentially I put it like uh, uh, employment is one 
um, out of uh, three E's, and environment is the second one, and the economies is the third one. So how 3D printing can have impact on the three E's. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning can be used in order to predict demands. Blockchain in healthcare, digitization in, in distribution system, as I have mentioned before. So uh, uh, these are uh, uh, reassuring, as I mentioned before, that some of these, the time critical item in Australia that we are looking at and trying to uh, uh, come up with some uh, uh, solution towards that. So these are potential uh, areas and these are some of these uh, research. Uh, we wrote, along with one of my uh, colleagues uh, from RMIT, we wrote uh, some of these uh, little uh, uh, so-called uh, desktop research, if you like, in the context of Bangladesh. And uh, one is how blockchain can be applied in uh, RMG sector, in remittance, in pharmaceutical and one of the one of the uh, areas that uh, um, uh, that economy our economy hasn't addressed which is a halal food uh, it's not only halal meat uh, but halal food uh, and the halal products so there could be manufactured products as well uh, and uh, therefore uh, there is a huge uh, opportunity for us with uh, for export oriented halal food and use of blockchain to make it trustworthy so these are some of these were in 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 bangladesh uh, can be looked at this is my final slide and uh, uh, i think i've said enough uh, but uh, yes uh, there's a lot of challenges as you have said in terms of uh, implementation of uh, disruptive technologies but there is no way out we actually have to take on board and uh, develop our skill and implement that in our economy as much as possible I end my presentation with a little uh, quotation which I picked up uh, from a TED talk uh, when goods are digital they can be replicated with the perfect quality at nearly zero cost and they can be delivered almost instantaneously, like our music, as I mentioned before. The answer is not to slow down. Instead of racing against the machine, we need to learn to race with the machine. This is our grand challenge. Thank you so much. Diversifying supply chain uh, is not easy. Uh, it, co it would cost a lot of money. Uh, however, uh, one product uh, and one supply chain is not going to feed all products. That's for sure. So, as we mentioned before, that products dictates the process. And uh, therefore, we really, t really have to align that. that uh, and, and, uh, and one of the things that I would suggest, that an organization may have hundreds of products. But we need to find out uh, simple ABC analysis in, our, you know, in a rudimentary way. And find, we definitely would find that only perhaps 10% of the products uh, which are making 90% of the revenue, invariably it would be there. If that's the case, then we have a, a dedicated supply chain for those 10%, uh, which, could be, which could be diversified supply chain because we want to address them, we want to optimize those, and we want to maximize our benefit. And for the rest 90 products, or 90% of the product, we could have a generic supply. The next one is basically regarding uh, local manufacturing. So more and more, if you see in the US and other places, uh, they're going for, because of the broken supply chain, they're going for localized manufacturing of raw materials like processors and others. Uh, would it be the trend that you see coming up uh, that 
even for the because just like the tennis ball example that like it moved like 50,000 miles is that that it will be more locally manufactured now with the broken supply chain or do you think that it's not going to happen my gut feeling and um, that uh, supply chain in the future is going to be much more shorter okay so what it means is localization yeah Okay. And uh, that is invariably is going to happen. As I mentioned in my presentation as well, that these disruptive technologies like three D printing would be would be would be uh, would be something which would make the supply chain much more simpler uh, and much more shorter. And uh, of course, uh, 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 in terms of uh, the production and uh, and the consumption, uh, that network that network would be much more that supply chain would be shorter however uh, there still be uh, products like raw material that may come from f a distant mm -hmm. place uh, however the major supply chain is going to be localized, localized. there's no doubt about okay it. Yeah, that's that makes sense uh, and the last question is actually related to the teaching side so you, you, you showed all these soft skills and hard skills that we need to develop now uh, in your, because supply chain for us is a very, in our side is very like a kind of a very methodical subject that we teach. But how do you kind of bring in those soft skills, teaching the soft skills within the curriculum, uh, in particularly in case of supply chain management? Oh, thank you for that. Uh, I think this is a big challenge. Uh, what we need is to have uh, the supply chain student to do some of the courses which are related with the human resources, for example. And uh, to make those courses, I personally believe that uh, supply chain is, is, is a management degree. And therefore, we cannot have management without knowing leadership. We cannot have management without being a team team player, and uh, and uh, therefore uh, uh, we need to we we need to incorporate some of the courses uh, in 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 supply chain domain, and uh, that could be uh, the starting point. Not going into the detail into the uh, the advanced courses on supply chain, but the basic courses. Uh, uh, or, uh, when we are offering in first year, for example, uh, then we can have uh, at least one or two courses which deals with the softer aspect. And then, of course, they can learn others, other uh, special courses. Uh, I would also emphasize here that when they would be learning this, uh, it would be a big challenge for us, and we must be, must, must be prepared for that, that supply chain is all about collaboration, is all about leadership to develop strategies. And therefore, when there would be the, the, the courses like, say, strategy course would be delivered, uh, uh, the person who would deliver uh, must, uh, must be aware of uh, that uh, these things would be related to supply chain eventually and how that's going to play and uh, that's how they would be able to learn better and make use of it, not in an isolation. Uh, because if, if they learn that one in isolation, it would take a little longer for them to, uh, uh, to, 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 for them to relate. Uh, why, why have I learned communication? Why have I learned uh, teamwork? Uh, but... Uh, the, the person, the academic who deliver that must have to come up with examples that with respect to supply chain and then it would be contextualized and then that would be useful. But this is a big challenge, definitely. Because if I'm a supply chain uh, person, then I might say, oh, I know optimization. I know how to develop the network. I know IT a little bit and therefore I can put it like this. But it is fundamental, and from uh, the, the, at the very beginning of my presentation, I did mention about J. Forrester's work. And um, obviously, it is the collaboration, it is the communication, it is the understanding, it is the transparency. These are all softer skill. And the supply chain and logistics manager must understand this. This is the primary, uh, I would say that, uh, skills that they must have before uh, learning the harder skills. Yeah. Yes, they have to learn 
how to manage inventory, how to forecast if necessary that they have to forecast, and other things as well. Okay, thank you so much. And the last part is basically that's from my side, uh, because we're trying to kind of uh, bring in a lot of uh, practical uh, training. So uh, me and my uh, colleague on supply chain management who teaches supply chain management was thinking that uh, is it possible to kind of give them like 15 days of apprenticeship program somewhere so that uh, they can learn a few things on the ground and everything because the problem with the MBA in Bangladesh is a lot of the MBA comes actually without work experience. So they think that after BBA they do the MBA. 50% uh, of them actually come without the work experience. And for them to learn uh, quite a bit of the concepts that are very practical oriented gets very difficult. And now in, in, in your curriculum in RMIT, how do, you, how do you incorporate the practical learning into the supply chain management? Uh, we call it, uh, our, in our program, we have a, uh, in the third year, uh, we have industry-based placement. Mm -hmm. So all our students uh, would be placed at an organizational level. They would be given a task by the academics, and they would have two guides one from the industry from that particular organization other academic and both this person would be aware that what this person is going to handle when they are here at the shop floor for example so they work together and uh, they at the end of the year they would write a long dissertation and uh, interestingly that you ask this question majority of our students who get this placement the fourth year when they come back they would join us as a part-time student the reason is that they possibly by that time gotcha. would find a job with that particular organization already so they feel that well i have a job now so let me continue with my degree as a part-time student many of them would do okay. that okay. so that's one way the other way is a co-op program that we have. We call that co-op program. That is a much more shorter one. That's for about 10 weeks, that program. And again, uh, we assign them a problem. They would go to the industry. They would not work like before because when they work, they actually paid full time for their work. But here, they are not being paid, but they would be given some, uh, you know, the documents they, need, they, need, they, they require to uh, understand the problem, and they would make a presentation at the farm level. So that's how we also try to, uh, you know, uh, integrate our student with the industry. But uh, 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 although I said uh, that this is, this is something that we do, but this is something for RMIT is going on for many, many years. Yeah. And that's why <coughs> we could do this. But we still face a lot of challenges as well with mm -hmm. this program. It's not easy. Okay. It's, it's definitely not easy. Uh, but we have that reputation that we build. And uh, therefore, uh, things are running smoothly. But it is not easy, to tell you very frankly. And that should be, uh, that should be actually the focus for uh, 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 universities here or the program on uh, undergrad and the master's program here that how they can actually learn what actually happening at the industry level and uh, this is amazing because I did mention three of my PhD students one um, uh, uh, and, and all three are my colleagues right now um, so I, I, I take uh, I, uh, that's a pleasure for me to having them as colleagues one of them is from India South Indian a young lady. And when she was collecting data here, obviously she had to face a lot of challenges here. So uh, she was staying in my, uh, at my in-laws place here and uh, spent uh, almost three months in collecting data. Uh, it was not easy. Uh, so access to industry in this country is not easy. Uh, it's not easy in Australia either. And I have seen during my PhD in the UK, it was not easy in the UK as well. That's what I have heard. So it's never easy, but I think uh, this is something that we got to do. And how do we do that? Uh, that is something that each and every individual university have to decide. But I believe it is possible, 
for the private universities, uh, more so because, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, in the majority of the private universities, the member of the boards are actually industrialists. So they do have their own firms, they do have their own organizations where they could go and uh, actually uh, have the placement and work there. I think what we need is the drive and uh, that has to come, uh, come from within the in, uh, organization which is in this particular case is the university and uh, take it forward. And I personally believe that there is a there is a huge it is a big challenge, but we must, as I said, we must take this challenge if we really want to do something for our um, uh, uh, graduates and for our industry at the same time, uh, because uh, it's it's industry would be hugely benefited through this process. Uh, they may not realize. I remember in <coughs> 2010. I was here and uh, I actually, uh, as part of a discussion forum, uh, I invited, uh, I was given the responsibility to invite few people uh, and uh, discuss about the industrial issues, you know. So I invited uh, the then, uh, the president of uh, uh, BGME uh, uh, and uh, uh, the president couldn't be uh, couldn't join because uh, he was traveling to Nepal at that time. I remember that precisely, and uh, I invited uh, one of these uh, secretary of of of, of uh, relevant uh, uh, ministry here and an academic who is coming from the U.S. There was a little uh, what do you call a, a sort of a conference here at that time. So, was one thing was very interesting that. Uh, somebody was raising a question that why don't you employ industrial engineers, you know, in RMG sector, you know, graduate in engineers. And uh, this person from uh, BGME was saying that no, uh, because their expectation is very high. They are not going to stay here longer and therefore would like to recruit the diploma engineers. Uh, yes, that's, uh, that's the fact, that's the reality. And, and however, how do we equip those people in a better way with the management skills, you know, uh, so that we can improve our productivity? And uh, when we talk the productivity, not only in Bangladesh, in many different countries, we talk about productivity with respect to the labor only, you know, the floor. We don't talk about the productivity with respect to the managers. So that's where we need to focus as well, that what is the productivity of these supply chain managers or these or this procurement managers or, or the line managers here, you know. So I think a lot can be done, uh, but I think we need to spend time and effort. Uh, and I'm pretty sure uh, things are moving and all these private universities I could see that uh, over the last 20 years has turned into excellent institutions and I'm pretty sure over the next 10 years things would be changed and um, I personally uh, m uh, believe that uh, m uh, uh, private universities had to spend uh, quite a bit of time, energy, effort, and resources for research and industry engagement. And uh, that's something I would like to see uh, in this country with these universities, uh, that research uh, and industry engagement. There's no other alternative that the way that we could move forward and, uh, and, uh, and uh, become, uh, you know, good at teaching and research institution in this country. And I would like to see some of these institutions turn into a regional institution. You know, not simply a good institution in Bangladesh, but it's a regionally known institution. At least from each university, if they have a center of excellence, uh, maybe uh, uh, ULAB may have one where they have got the, uh, uh, the cap capability and the competencies at a very high level, which I don't know. Uh, they can say that, well, with this, we would like to develop a center of excellence and which would be known in this region. You know, so anybody doing research, anybody teaching, anybody would like to visit, they would visit ULAB in this. So that's, that's something that uh, can be done. It is possible. And uh, uh, I actually, uh, on the other day, I wrote a piece for the local newspaper 
that we talk about uh, Vision 2041. But how do you achieve that? Uh, and um, one of the ways is actually that through reputation and uh, and I made some suggestion with respect to how, how the not with the private sector private uh, universities but it is in general universities and especially public universities if you have 50 public universities if none of these universities can rank within the top uh, thousand universities globally then where are we right now so we must concentrate on something and with respect to rmg i did mention that as a proposal that in this particular sector we had enough 40 years uh, the history of it we have been producing clothes and earning money that's fair enough but we'd like to see a brand bangladesh somebody one or two particular company would say that this is our brand and that's how we develop the name and the fame that needs to be done so there are uh, lots of ways. When I see that somebody published in an international journal, the name comes of um, uh, Imran Rahman, um, uh, uh, um, Department of uh, Business Studies and uh, uh, ULAB. It is, it is going to every individual academics globally. What you do internally, many people may not know how well you teach in the classroom how well the graduates are nobody would know that but if you publish one in the international journal everybody sees that you lab oh yeah very good so that's the reputation for research that would carry me thank you thank you very much sir thank you Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Rahman. Uh, it's a great pleasure, uh, particularly having the both sides uh, from the academia and as well as from the global supply chain. Uh, thank you, Nakabe, for coming and really appreciate it. Imran sir is waiting, so he will join us soon. Uh, I, would, I would now invite uh, Mr. Nakib Khan, President of Bangladesh Supply Chain Management Society, to share his remarks. Uh, probably, particularly, my interest would be to know about the supply chain issues in Bangladesh, particularly in the post pandemic side, and also. Uh, the skill sets that are kind of required by the industry at this point of time uh, and whether as an industry we're getting it or not. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, good evening. First of all, my apology for being late, because uh, it's typical supply chain problem of Bangladesh, yes, I, as I can say like that. Uh, I was start, I was, I've been started uh, from our factory in Gajipur, f almost five hours, uh, so it took almost five hours now to arrive here from Gajipur. Same, unbelievable. We cannot predict what time I will be needing there. Anyway, so my apology for that. First of all, my... Uh, Thank you very much, Professor Shams Rahman, for being with us here. Uh, on uh, Greetings from uh, Bangladesh Supply Chain Management Society. And thank you, ULAB, for organizing such a nice uh, program. Uh, uh, we uh, actually, it's very much needed. It's very much contemporary at this stage of Bang in Bangladesh. As I mentioned by Professor Rahman, that uh, we are having uh, we have Vision 2041 as a developed nation, to be a developed nation. So for that, so we need to work on supply chain management vigorously, I must say. Because we have a lot of issues, a lot of uh, infrastructural issues, a lot of logistics issues, a lot of understanding, and most importantly, the, the resources that we have. We don't have that kind of resources in Bangladesh still, I must say, because supply chain management in, in progress so well in globally, uh, evolved so well globally, but comparison to that, in comparison to that, Bangladesh is still in front, I must say. So we need to grow in that area. We need to have a resource. We need to develop the persons, personals, uh, to be, to work in the supply chain management in Bangladesh. Because, as you know, we are embracing fourth industrial revolution. So we need technology. We need to have understanding of the technology. We need to have, uh, we need to have the knowledge about the supply chain management, how we work in this arena. 
especially in this digital world, especially in this uh, technological advancement of global technological advancement in supply chain management, still we are, we are nowhere, you can say. That's why, Professor Roman, uh, really, really, I appreciate your efforts to say a few words on this uh, subject. And this is really encouraging for all of us who are actually practitioners of supply chain in Bangladesh, and especially uh, as, a, as a president of Bangladesh Supply Chain Management Society. I really congratulate Mr. Rahman for delivering your speech. Fantastic, I must say. And uh, we need to learn a lot on that because we need supply chain professionals badly in Bangladesh. Because still, we don't have that much of resources. Still, we don't have that much people who actually run, who actually uh, man behind the machine is very important, as he mentioned. Productivity of the managers, he already mentioned that. So we, when we talk about this uh, government's RMG sector, we, we talk, if we talk about the productivity, always we talk about the labor and other productivity. But there are other elements also, like lead time, like cost, other elements also. So everything is needed to have Productive of the productivity of the managers so, and the productivity with the industrialist. That is also important. The entrepreneurs' productivity is also important. So sometimes uh, we can say that, oh, entrepreneurs, they're, they're, they're actually above all. No. They also know, they need to know about the supply chain process also. They need to know how best they can work, they can implement the best practices, best practices globally. So these are the things we need to work out. And Bangladesh Supply Chain Management Society always uh, welcome this kind of initiative. And we are uh, actually we are under discussion with Professor Imran Rahman, our Honorable Vice Chancellor of ULAB. So we were uh, we would like to have an MOU with ULAB, with the Bangladesh Supply Chain Management Society, to develop uh, supply chain courses or develop supply chain curriculum, so that uh, we also need your support. So to that, we uh, we will have a wonderful curriculum in ULAB so that we can support the uh, requirement of Bangladesh supply chain professionals. And we need to develop the people, we need to develop the resources, and that is very much needed. Uh, 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 so on that note, actually, once again, thank you very much, ULAB. Thank you very much, Professor Shams Rahman. And uh, we are looking forward to uh, having more and more interactions in, uh, in this area of, uh, in this field of supply chain management. This is the priority area for Bangladesh, I must say. Um, when we talk about the infrastructural development, uh, for example, uh, in Bangladesh, still, still, a lot of things need to be done, especially in infrastructure, especially in logistics arena. So that's why uh, I need, we need uh, the support like, uh, support from the university of like ULAB and also the, uh, the, the experts, uh, global experts like Professor Shams Rahman, we need your support to develop this kind of uh, um, supply chain professionals in Bangladesh. So thank you very much once again. Uh, looking forward to work together with ULAB and also Professor Rahman, you can support us on that. You will, it will be great help. Thank you very much. Welcome Mr. Professor Imran Rahman. So I'm sorry once again for the late. Uh, it's, it's five hours on the road. Uh, it's also supply chain problem. It's also supply chain issue, <laughs> typically because supply chain has to perform in the right time, right uh, in the dot of the time. But unfortunately, we cannot predict in Bangladesh. So that is also a big issue for Bangladesh as well. Anyway, thank you very much once again for inviting me and collaborating with uh, Bangladesh Supply Chain Management Society. So let's. Supply chain is all about collaboration. So if you can collaborate each other, so we can build a beautiful Bangladesh and, uh, uh, in future, and we will have uh, a, a, a developed nation in 2040, inshallah. Thank you very much. Well, this was a, a really 
high quality um, event because um, we had an academic, a professional uh, supply chain. We had a professional in supply chain also representing the Bangladesh supply chain. Management society. Huh? Management society. Management society. And we have a university. And we have also a, a partner called the EMK Center represented by. So, so it's a, I mean, so many boxes we have ticked. And I was thinking we could have ended if somebody could bring a keyboard and a guitar, <laughs> right? <laughs> we, <Yeah>. could, <laughs> we, we, could, we could end with a jam. As you know, Nakib and I are in Renaissance band together. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me start with, first of all, uh, uh, Professor Shams Rahman. Thank you, Shams, for really agreeing to come here. And, you know, with your enlightening, you know, take on the, you know, about the potentials of supply chain uh, for a country, growing country, developing country like Bangladesh. And um, I hope that this collaboration with the society, with ULAB, you know, we'll take this to the next stage. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Nakib, um, for representing the, the society. And, um, you know, I know that we, I'll be participating with you in the Supply Chain Award. Excellence, award. Excellence Awards for the, is the second year running? Uh, third year. Third year running. I'm, I'm one of the privileged jury members. And, um, I am learning so much. And the fact that Asif, who is also the director of our MBA program, and Asif is the one who kind of convinced me that, sir, we need to start supply chain, uh, you know, a specialization at ULAB. And we want to start it with the right kind of partners. Because Amrajudi Shudumatro, um, academic sector, we'd make a hash of it. <laughs> Sorry. We, need, we needed to talk to the, you know, professionals, and also, we, I hope we will also get the wisdom of somebody like uh, Dr. Shams, who's, you know, in this area and specialization, and, you know, we expect to learn a lot from you. Thank you. So, Asif, again, thank you, and thank you also to the EMK Center, and um, thank you all, audience, for watching, and so it's a good evening from all of us here. Thank you.